I'm Yusai Khan. Welcome to One World. It was here in the city of Salvador, Bahia, that Brazil began. Although it was the Portuguese who first settled here, today 80% of Bahians are of African descent. The marriage of these cultures has given birth to a uniquely Bahian way of life. Céus e mares eu andei, vi um poeta e vi um rei, na esperança de saber o que é o amor. Ninguém sabia me dizer que eu já queria até morrer, quando um velhinho com uma flor assim falou. Geologists believe that billions of years ago, Africa and South America were side by side. Brazil still seems to be straining in that direction, especially in Bahia, where history connects the two continents as well. When Portuguese explorers landed here in the beginning of the 16th century, they saw before them a vast continent, rich in resources, a source of wealth for the Portuguese empire. The land was fertile, and the sugar and tobacco it bore soon put money in the hands of the colonizers. They settled in Salvador, made it their capital, and set about building mansions and estates. They also built magnificent churches and covered them with the gold they unearthed from the Brazilian soil. The Portuguese did not accomplish this alone. Unable to subdue the Native American population, they began importing slave labor from Africa. By the 17th century, Africans and people with mixed blood outnumbered the Portuguese two to one. Culturally, the two groups quickly became entwined, but the blacks remained enslaved. For them, the riches of Brazil meant rootlessness, exploitation, and pain. <coughs> A young Bahian poet heard Africa's cry and wrote, Today, victims of destiny, my children are beasts of burden in this universe. I, their father. Today, America gorges itself on my blood. Condor changed into a ferocious vulture, bird of slavery. These are the words of one of Brazil's most celebrated poets, Castro Alves. He was a part of the abolitionist movement that called for the liberation of the slaves. Meanwhile, the slaves were fighting for their own liberation using skills they brought with them from Africa in the form of martial arts. This is Makuleli a lethal art with knife in hand. Most of the time, the slaves substituted sticks and were able to practice in front of their masters, who were fooled into thinking it was only a dance. Playful movements disguised another martial art, capoeira. On wealthy colonial estates like this one, slaves practiced a series of deadly kicks hidden amongst cartwheels and backflips. If a stranger approached, the musicians could warn the others to interrupt their fight. successfully used these techniques to escape from bondage and in a number of cases set up independent self-governing communities none of which survived today men and women study capoeira in schools all over Brazil as much for its acrobatic beauty 
as for its application to self-defense. Salvador, today a city of a million and a half, was originally built on a hill high above the Bay of All Saints. The city's businesses now occupy more modern quarters on the streets below. The La Cerda elevator conveys passengers from the lower city to the upper city, where the elegant governor's palace is. A short walk away is Pelorino, the oldest part of the city. The name means pillory, and it is here that the slaves were once punished by flogging. At the bottom of the square stands Rosario dos Pretos, a church which the slaves built for themselves. In resplendent churches like San Francisco, slaves were segregated from the rest of the congregation and relegated to more austere surroundings. Although the Catholic religion was imposed by the Portuguese, the slaves saw in it a way of retaining their own religious practices. They discovered parallels between the Catholic saints and their own ancestral gods, the Orishas. When the priests spoke of the Christian savior, Jesus, they thought of Oshala, their god of creation. In this way, the slaves modified the religion they brought with them from Africa and called it Condomble. The easy coexistence of Condomble and Catholicism characterizes religious practice in Bahia to this day. This is Bon Fim, the most popular church in all of Bahia. While it is strictly a Catholic church, people of all persuasions come here to worship. They are especially attracted by the miracles that are said to occur here. A small room off the sanctuary houses photographs and strange relics representing miracle cures. Outside, children and adults hawk the famous Bonfim ribbons. They can be seen everywhere in Bahia. It is said that if you wear one on your wrist until it falls off, your wish will come true. Superstition plays a key role in Condomble. These performers are enacting the dance of the Orisha, the ancestral gods, who are neither male nor female. Through dance, the initiated seek to incarnate the gods. This dancer represents Oshun, the goddess of beauty and vanity. Legend has it she lives in this lake, so people come here to make offerings to her. Many condomble rituals are performed in secrecy. The mystery which surrounds them and their rich texture have generated a mystique which have inspired both artists and intellectuals. Condomble worshippers believe that each person has a particular god who protects him or her. People commune with their gods by wearing its colors, making offerings to it, or eating its food. The food of the gods can be found all over Bahia, but it is most commonly sold on the street. This vendor is a Bahiana. The term literally means woman from Bahia, but it has come to refer to these full-skirted and turbaned black women whose cooking epitomizes Bahian cuisine. The main dishes originated in Africa, but they incorporated native South American ingredients. The most essential is dente, a golden palm oil. These fried loaves are made from a paste of beans. They are served with shrimps, salad, or other concoctions made from okra, peanuts, coconut milk, cashews, and a whole array of exotic spices. Many Bahianas cook as an offering to their gods, but this woman told us she's simply earning a living. 
where so much secrecy surrounds Candomblé that it's hard for an outsider to know for sure. It is said that about one-third of Brazilians are black and that almost everyone in the country is of mixed blood. The enormous influence of African tradition on Brazilian culture is undeniable, but in spite of this, blacks have made few inroads into the mainstream of Brazilian political or economic life. Of course, there is always an exception to prove the rule. This is Evaldo Brito, a successful man by anyone's account. He's a lawyer and the only black teaching at the University of Salvador's Faculty of Law. He's also the only black from Bahia currently running for the National Constituent Assembly, Brazil's equivalent to Congress. If he wins the election, he will be one of the only two blacks among 548 national representatives. Is this disproportionate representation due to racial prejudice? I asked him. We really don't have racism in the Nazi sense of the word, in the sense of South Africa, where people are separated because they were born of a certain race. No, here people of different races can live alongside each other. The problem is this living together depends on a lot of personal conditions, and as blacks aren't in a position to arrive at the point where whites can arrive, segregation comes about through a natural social selection. His wife, Reginalda, is a university professor who has closely examined the problems of blacks in Salvador. While they face many social and economic barriers, Reginaldo sees possibilities for blacks to advance. I believe their advancement may come about through consciousness raising itself, in school, as part of their education, but really forming a consciousness. And I think that this will come about when they start to educate themselves. There's a very interesting episode that I tell from when I was a candidate for mayor of this city. A member of the electorate, who was the same color as I, said she wouldn't vote for me because, like her, I was black. So she thought I couldn't accomplish anything. So there's a lack of consciousness about the power that we have. In the last two years, Brazil has entered a new political period, leaving behind a 20-year military dictatorship for the challenges of democracy. The Brazilian people have welcomed this advance and see in it the possibility for a brighter future. For the Britus, this includes the opportunity for Brazilians to begin addressing the question of race. And so I think, and so does my wife, that in the future the fundamental element for change will be the black people's own strength, when they themselves become conscious of the value of the power that they have. And so the Bahia that inspires poets and musicians, whose voice calls out mysterious incantations from the past, is not only a cultural wellspring. Its African roots also serve as a source of strength and identity for a people striving to fulfill their dreams. Here in Bahia, one can almost believe that miracles do happen. But the biggest miracle of all is the Bahian people themselves. Their inventiveness and their imagination bring out the poetry in life. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Yusai Khan in Bahia, Brazil, for One World. <laughs>